Welcome to Researching the Future. I'm Jackie Rourke. In this episode, we're researching the future of food. What we eat and how we get our food is constantly evolving. There's research underway all over the world to make our food healthier and increase its production. Some of the most groundbreaking research is being done right here in Montreal. For example, fresh produce. We import produce from the four corners of the planet, but that brings with it its own concerns such as harvesting before ripeness and the environmental impact of shipping food long distances. Our first story is about a company in Mirabel, Quebec that is growing fresh produce year-round in a completely controlled environment. With the help of researchers from McGill University, they say their cubic farming system is more energy and water efficient and the produce grown is higher in nutritional value. Check out Urban Barns. This system, we believe, is the way of the future. It's going to happen, and if it's not us, it's going to be something else. I'm looking at it similar to like the internet. When Netscape came along, it, everybody says it changed the world, and it did. This is that early stage of the, how the technology is. So the research and development for Urban Barns has been going on for just about five years, uh, and mostly out in Langley in BC but we got involved with McGill and uh, uh, into a research partnership, so they can offer us a lot of research, and so it made total sense for us to bring the first commercial operation to Quebec. And so we expect to expand throughout Quebec and, and bring uh, economic development and jobs here to this area. We're finding that each kind of plant has a slightly different need. If we're looking at the over the shoulder there, you can see purple light, and that's just a blend of red and blue light that makes this coloration. We're not positive that's the right mix. We know that it works and we can grow happy plants, but we think there's probably a better mix. So what happens if I add a little bit of green or add a little bit of white light to this stuff? Can I push them that much faster? And the goal is that instead of taking 20 days or 30 days to grow the plants, maybe I can get them down to 15 days. As a production supervisor, I take care of the plants from uh, seed to when we harvest them basically and I make sure that they get enough water, that uh, whatever's in the water is good for them. We require water to start the system. As the plants uptake the nutrients, they then will transpire it back into the air. We then run it through our HVAC system, so a dehumidification system, which then allows the water to be recovered and can be returned back to the system. So our w water loss is around 5%. If we went into the middle of a desert, we could have a big tank supply us initially, and then we don't have to have a continuous water supply. Unlike a field, which you have to be continuously irrigating and you're losing all that water into space, here we can recover almost all that. So everything needs to be exactly as the plants want it to be. The lights, the temperature, the humidity, uh, the CO2 levels inside, we monitor. But we also monitor for the sugar content, carbohydrates, fiber content, protein content, and these are also other things that we're monitoring. We're finding that we're, I can't say we're quite double, but we're just about double what the USDA standard is. Um, so when they measure all the plants around North America, they say this is the standard, and we're, we're in the upper 10% of the top. And in some cases, we're higher, and sometimes we're just at that 10%. Let's say we get lettuce from here in a standard grocery bag. It's most likely come from California, and it wasn't grown in California. There's a good chance it was grown in Mexico was transported up to California, was repackaged in California, and then was shipped to us. So it takes two or three days to get to California, then it takes a week for it to reach us. So we're measuring these things almost 10 days after they're harvested. When we're measuring ours, we're measuring the day it was harvested, or within hours of it being harvested. And we don't have to harvest the fruit early so that we can make it transported. What we do is we harvest it when it's at its peak of ripeness so that we can supply it to the consumer at that moment. So we want things that grow really fast, that have a fairly high turnover, and have a poor shelf life. We can do tomatoes, so there's super dwarf tomato plants that are about six inches high and are, do a lot of good production out of that. Um, there's also raspberries, blueberries that could be grown in there, which are fairly small little plants and have a high turnover. So my guess is within five years we'll start to see all this. The technology is almost there. The LED lights are we're like so close. The new, newest technology is what, that we're testing, we believe, is the technology that's required to solve almost all of our lighting problems. 
but there's some people that believe that if it doesn't come from the soil, then it's not a healthy plant. And we have to convince them that the plant is still healthy even if there is no soil present. I, I can grow a plant in, in the air and just spray water at it and it's still a healthy plant. So here we can see the roots are starting to develop on it, which is a nice healthy little bit of spot. People worry about our product being grown indoors that it's not natural that we're somehow doing something unnatural to the plants, but in fact, that's not the case at all. We're giving them the best environment they can possibly have. We don't use any pesticides, any herbicides and so on, so there's no runoff containing harmful uh, chemicals. The cost between our production method and a field farming production method is very comparable. It's not going to be out of line at all because when you have a field farm production style, then you have to add transportation. My background is in the transportation industry and so I saw firsthand how much food actually gets thrown in the garbage and for me it's the future of food to grow it right where the people are. Out of our DC we're using 12 volt yeah. uh, 40 amps is what each one of the power bars can supply. The technology we believe is transmittable anywhere in the world. But as we get into the rural areas or the more isolated areas, they have to transport large distances, but they also have issues with water, energy requirements. So we can't set up a warehouse that's this size up in the far north. But we could do something smaller scale, enough to feed 20 people, 100 people, maybe 1,000 people. Most head of lettuce cost around $3, 2 to $3 a head here in Montreal. We should be able to do that anywhere in the world. Consumers will be able to find our product soon in a test market in the Montreal area. And then starting in the spring, it'll be Quebec-wide in all the IGAs. We don't need to transform as much land to put into agricultural production to meet the needs for the future. It is going to slowly progress and then over the next two, three, five years, we're going to see these large centers set up almost in every city in the world. And then over the next few years, it could potentially migrate into the smaller communities also. It's hard to see the future as not being this. With all our modern science, one thing hasn't changed. Fruits and vegetables continue to be the cornerstone of good human nutrition. But why these plants are so good for our health continues to be revealed. For example, the potato. A staple of most diets around the globe, the potato has some hidden power that researchers at McGill University recently discovered. It may just be a key to fighting obesity. Potato is the number one vegetable in the world. It's grown in more than 80% of countries. And in terms of what is eaten, more potato is eaten than all other vegetables combined. It's fourth in importance to the major grain crops, rice, wheat, and corn. And actually, potato can deliver more than two to three times the nutrients than any of those grains can. So it is extremely important worldwide in nutrition. Okay, so these are the ones that are going to be sold. The goal of my research for some time has been to try to improve on the very best cultivar that Canada grows for processing and baking the russet Burbank cultivar. And in our lab, we use this potato tissue to try to regenerate plantlets that would have improved qualities over the original. The process starts with very small pieces of potato tissue that are placed in culture. Um, wound tissue is generated, and from all of the potato cells, new plants are grown. And the plantlets are then taken to the field. After a field season, we do uh, yield analysis and uh, test for sugars, and we select lines that have improved yield and processing characteristics. So originally, the point of my research was to find russet burback lines that had the uh, highest yield and the best frying properties, because that's what the commercial industry was interested in. After talking with Stan Kubo, we realized that we could be also selecting for potato lines that had better nutritional properties. Potato uh, can be a useful source of 
compounds called polyphenols. These are the compounds that have been linked with health benefits for red wine and dark chocolate. But the potatoes are actually, because they're food stable, the most important dietary source of uh, polyphenols. For instance, in the French diet, the number one source of polyphenols is not red wine, but it's potato. We wanted to see if there was big variations in polyphenol content among cultivated varieties of potato. They're called cultivars. Potato cultivars that were identified, we decided to do an extraction process to concentrate up to 20-fold higher content of the polyphenols. And uh, which treatments uh, are you I'm applying? I'm going to use different polyphenols, uh, synthetic uh, polyphenols. Polyphenols have a quality called anti-inflammatory, which is important against disease, a variety of diseases that are associated with inflammation, such as lung disorders. And in that light, air pollution causes damage to uh, lungs, including inflammation that causes that damage. And so we decided to test an animal model where animals were exposed to an air pollutant and then uh, see the protective effects of the extract. We demonstrated that there was potent anti-inflammatory and lung protection from the extract in those animals. So uh, to get the benefits, you would have to eat a lot of potatoes, which is not realistic, whereas an extract could be readily taken in as a supplement or taken as an ingredient in uh, certain foods. This uh, discovery is very exciting because it's one of the first to demonstrate of that a food item uh, or an extract can have this protective effect against air pollution. Uh, the problem with air pollution is there's no real uh, therapeutic or preventative approach that has been identified to date. And so this has the potential of uh, taken as a supplement to prevent against the maleffects of air pollution. So recognizing the potent anti-inflammatory effects of the extract, we brought in our colleague Lou Ashland to explore whether the extract was protective against the development of obesity and diabetes induced by diet. This really says that everything we've done before is completely reproducible. My area of interest is in the um, biochemistry and molecular biology of nutrition. And uh, we thought it would be uh, interesting to study the collection of polyphenols that's present in the extract. So what we did was we took uh, two groups of mice, both fed with a diet uh, that induces obesity, very much like the diet that we eat today. One group uh, received the potato extract and the other did not and followed them over a 10-week period. Amazingly, at the six-week time period uh, into the diet, we can clearly tell which group had received the potato extract versus the group that did not receive the potato extract. And that's because the group that received the potato extract were leaner compared to the other ones, uh, the other group, of course, which were fatter. And by the 10-week period, uh, the, it was very clear that uh, the potato extract uh, it was effective in uh, reducing the, the fatness of, of these mice that had received the diet that normally causes obesity. Our ultimate goal is, is to come up with some sort of product that the public can touch, perhaps a powder um, that people can put on their food uh, and they, they would know that it works and it would help them to lose weight and uh, uh, regain normal uh, body weight. So what's our next step? Our next step, I think, is to look at funding to do this in the human clinical context. That would be nice. Of course, the better way to approach this entire problem is to decrease the amount of calories uh, that we take in. But for those people who are already overweight and obese, this might help in improving um, uh, the capacity of the body to be able to help itself and uh, burn off, if you like, uh, the, uh, the excess calories. So when you think about it, this is not really too surprising considering that you know, mom always told me to eat my vegetables and it's the goodness of the vegetables in, in, in the whole thing that is what's promoting health. So mom didn't lie. Stroll down the aisle of your local grocery store and you're bound to notice new products on the shelves virtually every time you go. Food product development is part of food science, a relatively new and growing field that combines chemistry, biochemistry, microbiology, nutrition, and even engineering. The current trend is to merge concepts from food science with nutrition science 
to develop the next generation of new food products like functional foods and nutraceuticals. Let's go now to a lab at McGill University that is working on a process to make maple syrup a disease preventer. The food product development is more sophisticated today and the, the, it has to fulfill the needs of the consumers. It has to be a consumer-driven approach. It's not more like a product of hope. It means like the food industry will come up with the product and hoping that the consumer will like it. So it's ready, guys. Go ahead. To be able to do that, we have to understand what the consumer needs and to create innovative food products that will fulfill the needs of the consumer, we need a lot of science. For example, can we make our natural sweeteners, like an example maple products, more healthier? So we know that the consumer love food that they are sweet, they love drinks that they are sweet. And one project that we are working on it is actually to synthesize or to produce the prebiotics. Prebiotics, they are like a big family of functional ingredients. They are important because they stimulate the growth of the beneficial bacteria. They do promote the health of our intestinal tract systems. Prebiotics are carbohydrates found in foods like asparagus, garlic, onions, leek, and artichoke. They're not digested by our human digestive system. That means they survive intact all the way to the end of our intestinal tract, to the colon. That's where many, if not most, diseases start. Prebiotics trigger the production of beneficial bacteria that can fight off toxins leading to disease. So the goal of the research is to mass produce prebiotics in order to trigger this healthy prebiotic effect. So for our research, what we have done, we have looked at the different qualities of maple syrup, even the maple sap, and then we have looked at what can we use to produce these molecules prebiotics. And we have concluded that even the lowest quality maple syrup that is too dark to be used as a, a product can be used to produce these prebiotic molecules that can be added into different kinds of food. So the chemistry behind the prebiotic is very important because that determines how they are metabolized by our body, how they are fermented by lactic acid bacteria, determine their selectivity, their colonic persistence, and at the end, how they can promote the health of our intestinal systems, which is kind of the brain of our health. The prebiotics do exist naturally, but the amount that they do exist is very, very small. So we cannot make any economic use of this prebiotic that exists naturally. And that's how the science it comes. It comes by developing new enzymatic processes. What I'm trying to do is to change the structure of leaven sucrase, the enzyme, in order that it can be reused multiple times and keep producing prebiotics. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the enzyme, which is here, in contact with this solid support, and the enzyme will attach itself to the support. And then I just mix it like this for a few days at four degrees. Afterwards, I'll just have the solid support and I can put that into contact with the maple syrup. We'll leave that to mix and that will produce the prebiotics. Then afterwards, we can let the support settle, take the prebiotics out, add fresh maple syrup, mix it some more. We'll get more prebiotics and we can keep doing this process over and over again. So the, in, basically in our enzymatic process, the enzyme, which is the biocatalyst, is using the sucrose as the starting material to produce the fructooligosaccharides, where they do have a prebiotic properties. So the fact that we are going to use maple syrup, which is very rich in sucrose, like it does contain more than 60% of the sucrose, we are going to be able to enrich the maple syrup with the prebiotics. It can even be used to create candies or taffies that would have health benefits. So it's going to open a big possibility for the maple syrup producers. This process can be applied to many other sweetener-based food products, basically, not only maple, as long as we have sucrose there that can be used by the uh, enzymes. We have a patent on this process, and we are hoping that um, one day the consumer can buy a maple syrup enriched with the prebiotics and that can promote their intestinal health. Of course, we can create all kinds of healthy foods, but if people don't buy them, we're no further ahead. So what can we do to help people make healthy food choices? That is, after all, the bottom line question. 
And that's exactly the research of Dr. David Buckridge of the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatics, and Occupational Health at McGill University. David Buckridge is watching what you eat. The motivation for this research is that we, we look at what are the most important causes of death and disability uh, in Canada and countries like Canada. And chronic diseases are by far and away the most important. They're responsible for almost 90% of all death and disability. So that's things like diabetes, uh, heart disease. And if we want to, to address that problem, we can think about treatment and what we would do to, to help people once they have those conditions. But even better is to think about how we prevent those conditions so that people don't ever actually get diabetes or heart disease in the first place. So to, to think about prevention, we have to look at what are the factors that cause these chronic diseases. And it turns out one of the most important factors is diet, in the sense that it's one of the, one of the factors that really is responsible for a large part of these chronic diseases. But to do something about it, we have to know what people are actually eating, and we have to have some idea of how we can modify or help them make better choices. So traditionally, the way that, that uh, data are gathered on what people eat is by asking them, by doing a survey. The problem with surveys is that they're expensive to do, they're not done very frequently, and they don't give us the, the data that we need at, at the level of a neighborhood, for example, so they don't have that precision. So we looked around to see what, what other ways we could find data about what people eat. And through talking to people in the School of Management, our colleagues who work in marketing, we realized that, in fact, stores are, are actually collecting in real time when people buy, buy products, these data, So these data, as people purchase something, goes over a scanner and the data are actually entered into a database. In the past, the food industry has been using scanner data at the aggregate level, national level, for example, to understand consumer behavior. Um, what David and uh, Professor Laura Dubé wanted to do was actually to use some of this scanner data at a higher resolution, so at the neighborhood level, postal code level, to actually capture some of the nutrition information. So we start with the data that comes from the scanners or the scanning databases in every store and we can pull those together and then so for every product that's purchased we have a little bit of information about it. We know the name of the product, we know the price of the product and we have a code, the UPC code, you know that barcode you see on the back of everything you buy. It doesn't tell us actually what the nutritional value of that product is or how healthy it is. So to get that information we have to link every purchased item, so every can of Coke for example or every box of cereal we have to link that to another database that has that nutritional information, tells us how much sugar, you know, the information on that little box on the back of the product, essentially. And then the next step we have to take is to be able to say, well, based on that nutritional content, how healthy is that product? So is, you know, for example, is Coke healthier than orange juice? And it, it sounds like a simple question, but it's actually not so simple. So one of the first products we looked at was sugary soft drinks. And so we, we crunched the numbers, we did all the, the connections we had to the linkage, and then we created a map, essentially, looking at the amount of sugary soft drinks bought by neighborhood in Montreal. And that's quite useful because it shows us, you know, which neighborhoods are buying more of this product, which in this case we think is not as healthy as perhaps some other alternatives, and it gives us some opportunities to look at how that, those purchasing patterns over Montreal might relate to other variables or other things like, for example, household income, which we looked at in that, this particular study, and that then allows public health uh, and other groups to think about strategies or ways that they might help people in those particular neighborhoods to make better choices about those kinds of foods. So today's class is focusing on collaboration and we're looking at the challenges and opportunities that are available here in Montreal. We're going to be delving more into collaboration between McGill and other organizations here in Montreal and also the resources that are available for the students and for you as well in some of the work that, that you do. In alignment with McGill's vision of being more connected with the community groups, one of the things we've realized as we're carrying out research with the community groups is they indicate that they have certain needs, for example, when it comes to social marketing, right? And you have students who have these interests and these skills. So the community group members come to the classes and talk about what their needs are, and the students hear from them firsthand what some of those needs are. How can students like you contribute? It may sound funny, but you are the, the knowledge. You know a lot. You, sh you can come and propose us new way to do it, like Ni was doing when they came. They, we, they work 
uh, McGill work on something very good for the community. Uh, it's called Vers des environnements ag agroalimentaires plus sains. They work with us, and this is used to go on with, with that project. We're trying to build on that, and it was a really important part of the community. We're doing all these analyses to make available information to, to really help people make healthier food choices. And we do that by sharing this information with different partners, with public health agencies, with community groups that may want to mobilize resources in their community to help make people make better choices. We need to share the best practice and we don't really have time to find it. We need new people, young people, people who want to make a change. So we're helping the community groups develop information systems that enable them to figure out their priorities you know, when it comes to nutrition, for example, addressing obesity, what are the priorities and what, what data can they use to actually measure their, their progress? But I think there's a potential to do this on a much larger and more continuous scale and also make these data available to individuals. I think that's really what's going to change people's behavior is when they can really, you know, just like you can have an inventory of every transaction you make, for example, by looking at your visa statement and your bank statement, you could conceivably have an inventory of all the food you've purchased and you could look at that from a health perspective and you could have a dietary budget just like you have a financial budget. And so to me, I think that's the way that this is really gonna have an impact. Well, that's our show, Researching the Future of Food. I'm Jackie Rourke, thanks for watching.